Hello and welcome to Diminishing Returns, going back to Bond. Yes, this week we continue our journey through the Bond franchise with The Man with the Golden Gun. Roger Moore makes his second outing as MI6's finest, and let's just say he's still finding his feet a little. As always, Calvin will attempt to defend his beloved Bond from the very deserved criticism that we all throw at him. Enjoy! Hello, yes, we are back on Bond. I'm Calvin. I have a powerful weapon. He's got a powerful weapon. And you know what you've got, Alan? (laughs) Uh, um, uh, Oh, no, no, you wait. No, wait. You know what you do, Alan? (laughs) Um, You charge a million a shot. Oh, well, if I can get it. And Sol, do you know what you are? Uh. An assassin of second to none. (laughs) Yes, we're back on Bond with Roger Moore's second... James Bond film, The Man with the Golden Gun. This is Roger Moore's second film? Yes. Oh, God, I thought we'd done more than that. No, no, there's another five to go after this. Oh, oh you know what, guys? I'm really... I don't know what to do about this. I can because... tap out. I'm happy to tap out. Shall we have a vote? <laughs> well, no. do, do you want to know what the, We should probably address it here. The, the problem I've got is that I'm, films I'm trying to go through these in order. <laughs> I've only watched, like, I think I've seen up to Octopussy, but I've paused my personal viewing so I can just kind of go through it with the podcast. But I, I really want to do these in order, and I've never even watched any of the Daniel Craig ones, and I know they're not, I don't, I know you don't have to watch them in order, but this is one of the ways in which my, like, autism comes out. <laughs> I think I have to just watch things in order, okay? So the problem I've got is Danny Boyle is signed on to direct the new one. Yeah. And I've seen all the Danny Boyle films, pretty much, and I love uh, his work. And I don't know if I can wait like an extra five years on top of that coming out to see what it's like. Um, well, we're just going to have to accelerate the Bond films that we watch and discuss. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know if the listeners will be down for that. <laughs> Let's just skip them. Have, have you seen how the Bond episode <laughs> episodes rate? I mean, I don't know if 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 you if you listening want. More Bond than uh, tough, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's a quandary that you doesn't sound like you're going to let us solve, Sol. So, um, okay. So, Man with the Golden Gun, Roger Moore's second film, Live and Let Die was a, a big success. People seem to accept Roger Moore in the role, um, so they churned this out literally the year after Live and Let Die was released. It was the third oh. Bond film in four years. Don't. Was this a had they not really sort of churned these out before then? Was this kind well, of Well, a... yeah. <laughs> but after this one, there's always going to be... There's a three-year gap between this and the next one, and then after that, two years up until Timothy Dalton stopped doing the uh, the film series. So, yeah. Not to get ahead of myself, but I think I'm going to be more positive about this one than I tend to be about Bond films. Um, wow. Because mm-hmm. this one is one that like the fans like dog on quite a bit. Yeah, they what on? Dog on? <laughs> oh, dog on. Okay, I cu- I didn't quite hear what you said, and I wasn't sure if it was like a good thing that they do on it or a bad thing. But okay, <laughs> no, but I watched it because I've been rewatching all the Bond films again quite recently. So I watched this one last night. I tied it in with this, and um, yeah, I while I don't think it's the best Bond film anymore, which I mathematically uh, figured out when I was twelve <laughs> years old, I made a very large chart. <laughs> <laughs> of all the different elements of Bond films and rated them out of ten, and this one came out on top. So, uh, yeah. Well, so this was the best Bond film? Mathematically, yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Did you weight each element, though? Was it kind of like yeah, but you the know, best Bond girl, but that yeah. count, you know, Bond girl counts for 4% of the overall Yeah, score. how many shags is going to be <laughs> too low on your rateometer, isn't it? Um, I wish I could find that chart. Anyway, I, I I stopped thinking that for a while, but I watched it again yesterday, and I was um quite pleasantly surprised, actually. Really? Because I I have a question actually based on watching this, and it was um at what point, if ever, do the Bond films stop being shit? Because <laughs> <laughs> so far it's not going well. I mean, I I, yeah, one, I'm kind there's of there's been one actually solid good film so far. 
Which one's that? Doctor No, but he'll be saying Goldfinger probably. Goldfinger, yeah, that's it. Oh, Goldfinger's great. Yeah, I watched. I rewatched Doctor No actually two days ago, and yeah, poof, still don't like it very much. <laughs> I think. Um, I mean, as far as I know, this is just what James Bond's like, and it never gets any better. Well, yeah. I mean, to be fair, yeah. Well, is that true, Calvin? Or does it, am start... I going to enjoy it when Pierce Brosnan comes along? Yes, there's a, yes. There's you at will. least one good Pierce Brosnan film. You'll you'll enjoy it when Timothy Dalton comes along. I've rewatched those recently, and um... are you sure? Yeah, you, you <laughs> might. Okay. Well, no, actually, now that I like him, you might not, because no, I like just... I like I like Timothy Dalton. Look, every Bond film, genuinely, I go into it thinking this is going to be the one. I'm going to enjoy it starting now, and then I often enjoy the first ten minutes, hmm. and then I just sort of think, oh god. <laughs> Did you enjoy the first uh, ten minutes of this? The pre-credit sequence uh... is. Uh... Kind introduces of. Christopher Lee as the villain and his fun Yeah, you house. know, I did, actually. It, it made a nice change of pace from uh, James Bond being, like, in murdered. the coffin or something. Oh my god, he's been murdered! Yeah, exactly. It was nice <laughs> to not go through that bullshit as usual. Um, but they do have the waxwork likeness of him. Yeah, it was is, quite... They just can't help having that doppelganger Bond mm. thing at the start of these. Yeah. It was quite jarring at first, like, what the fuck is going on? But then, after... I seen enough of it to kind of know what was going on. I was like, okay, no, I quite like that it just threw us into this. and mm. Yeah, it was alright, actually. I quite enjoyed the opening. Yeah, yeah. So, we're introduced to quite a few characters. I don't know, actually, do you want to go through this, like, scene by scene, or go through it in, like, um, elements? Well, like, I, made quite, I made quite a lot of notes, just in sort of chronologically, so I'm... Yeah, okay, should we go, shall, notes, shall, shall yeah. I guide us through it scene by scene, and we can talk about the various elements as we go? Mm. Mm. But my, I mean, my, my opening note is, oh my god, he's got three tits. Uh, <laughs> that's the sort of level well, my, of notes I'm working at. <laughs> my, my opening note is that little guy is going to be trouble. I can just tell. So I think we've approached this. For this. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking, of course, about Christopher Lee as Francisco Scaramanga and Hervé Villachay as Nick Knack, the main villain and henchman of this film. <laughs> de plane, de plane. So, so, uh, um, so these two, despite what you may think about the film, and a lot of people don't like it very much, but you can't argue, I mean, these two are pretty iconic Bond villains, really. I did, yeah, I know Nick Knack. My, my friend at school used to make fun of my other friend, who was really short, by doing an impression of him going, Let me out, you big bully! <laughs> uh, which I believe was a quote from one of these Bond films. Is it this one? It is! It's, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> um... um can I ask a quick question here? You know Christopher Lee, right? Yes. Pretty well-respected actor and, you know, big big guy and all that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, everything I've seen him in, he's been total shit. Uh, so what's that about? Well, he's known for his Hammer horror, which yeah. was, like, crap. you know, shit, yeah. But, like, wasn't even, like, you know, it was campy. But it's like if Bruce Campbell somehow became a well-respected actor overnight. Yeah, I, I know what you're getting at. Well, yeah, fair enough. Like, how would that happen? Yeah, it's weird. So um, wh- at what point did Christopher Lee go from being, like, campy crap Bond villain actor to, oh, Christopher Lee, he's good. I think, you know, I think, well, Chris, you can have a go at him for the projects that he chooses to be in, but he is always very good in them. No, no, I don't think he's a bad actor, particularly. I just think he does bad films, and I've never seen him do great acting either. And and the, I think it's yeah, just because he, he outlived everyone. He's just sort of like, it was like, yeah, okay, he's good. You're right, actually. I, I, I've never seen him give a performance where I was like, wow, Christopher Lee's incredible. I've just seen him kind of give a performance where he talks at this level of volume and everyone... It's like, oh, he's loud. I guess he must have done Shakespeare on the stage at some point <laughs> to talk that loud. <laughs> I've made a note that young Christopher Lee just isn't right, is he? Young? Something, it's just not quite, it's just not right. <laughs> yeah, cause I'm only used to him as an old man. He he's about never 48. Sits well. <laughs> I know, but he doesn't sit right when he's got coloured hair. <laughs> Why does he always play like a half Mexican? Is, he, is it just because he tans well? Or is there some sort of... I think high cheekbones, that's it, isn't it? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't like the uh, I don't like the the uh, shade Alan's staring at the Wicker Man. By the way, I've just got to. Uh, well, we um, I know you're going to choose us to do the Wicker Man at some point uh, for yeah. the show, so I'll, I'll reserve my again. hatred for it then. <laughs> uh, Calvin, who is in the Wicker Man? Britt Eklund. There you go, <laughs> Britt Eklund. I know a nice little reunion. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. 
So, what did you think of Fran- of Christopher Lee as Scaramanga? I thought it could have been anyone, honestly. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> Do you is he a particularly iconic like the man with the golden villain, gun? Is, yeah, than, no, I think him. Gold other than Finger, it's Christopher Lee, Blofeld, uh, probably Christopher uh, Christopher Walken. Um, but isn't it just kind of like if Brad Pitt was the villain in the next Bond film and he just did a typical Brad Pitt performance? He'd be iconic because like he'd be an infamous villain in the Bond universe because it's oh yeah, that's the time Brad Pitt played the villain. It wouldn't be like wow, an incredible performance from no, no. Isn't it, I don't, I don't know if it's ever an incredible performance as such. Um, but certainly how it's written, how he plays it, I think he's really great. I mean, I think he's fine, I, I, yeah, but fine. I honestly think it could have been any of the people who played Blofeld or whoever was the villain in the last one. Like, I don't. It really wouldn't have made much of a was, difference. Um, to, uh... Was Vincent Price ever in line to play a Bond villain? Ooh, not now to my that would have been good. No, he wouldn't. Yeah, they... I'm not saying it would have been good at this character, that would have been amazing. but gen- in general. <laughs> no, <laughs> imagine not that. To my knowledge. <laughs> imagine in this film, even. He, Vince, who seems more likely to have a third nipple, Christopher <laughs> Lee or Vincent Price? Mm, fair enough. He'd be fantastic. He'd be so good at doing all. Oh, come, come, James. You know we can't all. Oh, the eggs! I've got to get in. There we go. Oh, come, come, James. You're a guest of mine on this island. <laughs> <laughs> I love the um, relationship that Scaramanga has with his henchman, Knickknack, who seems to just employ mm. gangsters to come to this island out of the, in <laughs> Thailand and just basically, like, try to kill Scaramanga. Because if he, if Scaramanga dies, Knickknack inherits the whole island, this paradise. Um, and mm. Scaramanga wants to keep his uh, wits sharp, so he doesn't mind that he's occasionally... Uh, <laughs> Hiring hitmen. It's exactly the dynamic between uh, Inspector Clouseau and Kato. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was thinking the same But thing. we're meant to take it seriously in this film. <laughs> we're meant to take it seriously. It. Yeah, this is not a serious <laughs> film. I mean, it's very comedic. I mean, yeah, you know what? I'll go with that. This film, I think part of why I didn't find this film as annoying as most of the Bond films to date is it did seem to have a better sense of what tone it was pitching itself mm. at. Um, mm, I don't know about that. Well, should we should we get into the plot itself? Because Bond is um, sent a golden gun bullet with his name engraved in it. And that kind of sets him off um, investigating why that ended up with him. Because MI6 know about Francisco Scaramanga. And they, this implies that Scaramanga has put a hit out on Bond. So... Well, my, my, ne- my next note is, has Roger Moore got worse at acting? Oh, in this film, he's very, I, um, yeah, his performance is kind of all over the place. I think he's being directed, Mm. um, this is a broader point, which is going to cover some plot that happens later, but here it feels like they're trying to make him do things that Connery would, especially in his treatment of women. Yes, I'll come back to that later. Yeah, okay, let's let's put a pin in that and come back to it later on, because there are a couple of scenes that really just are very jarring. But yeah, I think you can. I think he felt quite comfortable in the role in *Live and Let Die*. Here, less so. This feels like a first performance rather than a second one. He doesn't seem quite as um, sure of himself. Mm. So back to the plot. Roger Moore's Bond is uh, investigating sort of like Scaramanga and this whole thing about the golden bullets, and it turns out their previous double O agent was shot with a golden bullet. So Bond goes to find that, which this belly dancer is sort of using as a a lucky charm which she keeps in her belly oh, button. God, I hate it. I love that scene. That bullshit. And Roger Moore is oh, trying to get it God. out by like sucking it's... the belly bu- by sucking the bullet out of her belly button. Yeah, but as if you'd look at a belly dancer's little golden what charm. What if you look on at a belly, belly dancer's belly? <laughs> what? What are you talking about? As if you'd look at the little charm on a belly dancer's belly and go, yeah, that's a bullet that's been flattened after it's been fired. Well, if it looks like a a flattened golden bullet that comes from the one man who uses golden bullets, yes, you would think that. But, like, she's got no... I don't know, you wouldn't wouldn't look at it and think that's a bullet. You would, he knows that she's connected with him. My problem with that scene is that he goes in and he goes, oh, hello, belly dancer, Uh, I'm coming, I'm investigating something, and she goes, oh, do you want a shag? Um, and, I don't and then really he says, <laughs> "And then he says, well, you really do have a magnificent abdomen,' <laughs> I love that which line. I assume is 
<laughs> which I assume is like some sort of weird self parody that this series has entered into. <laughs> that I've missed. No. And no. then he swallows the. <laughs> and that's literally something Alan Partridge would say. But the, but why? I I, I just have the question right. Why? Like, is the idea that Bond is irresistible to women because she kind yes. of makes moves on him immediately, but he he doesn't even like have to chat her up or anything. Yeah. <sighs> I mean, I, I mean, I feel the same way about Sol's recent behaviour. I don't understand that. Really. <laughs> I was about to say, that's not my life. <laughs> is it just, it's just that Bond only ever talks to sluts? Is that, is that what this is about? I tell you what, no, it's not even that. I, I, I mean, the most recent one was off Bumble. Bumble's high, high class. I thought, oh, I'm going to have to go on like three dates at least here. <laughs> People like having sex, Alan. This is what I've come to realise. People in this world do. It is just a sort of a sex fantasy world, really. It's a cinematic... Oh, it's, it's yeah, it just... shares a cinematic universe with all those Ron Jeremy films where <laughs> he goes to the bank and then they're like, it's, it's not just you the... want to make a withdrawal? Why, yes, sir. Why don't you Here's a deposit. come around here and I'll make a withdrawal out of your penis. <laughs> well, and it's not... Slap bass kicks in. and It's not just that I think it's unrealistic or anything like that. It's just not good character. If we have a character that we're rooting for and he kind of goes in and seduces someone to get information out of them, which we do see Bond doing sometimes, then that's, I can go with that. But when he just walks in and she's like, oh yeah, come on, let's, are we going to have a sex then or what? It's just, it's crap. It's not good storytelling. It's not interesting. Mm. It's, it's just boring. I think there's something supernatural going on. In this case, it really is just to facilitate a fight sequence in which Bond has sort of swallowed the clue. That's really the only thing it's here for. I, I am, I am sad that we missed the sk- we skipped the scene where Bond has to sift through his shit to find <laughs> the book. <bullet. laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do like you just have a line with, a, the with a, a colander. <laughs> where he's like, "Yeah, you've no idea what I went through to get it here," or something like that. I like that. <laughs> Mm. My next note is about Lazar, the gun dealer. Yes, because Bond away. traces the bullet back to its maker, Lazar. Mm-hmm. Well, my my first note is, what race is Lazar supposed to be? Don't know, really. <laughs> I tell you what, he's not. Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not Chinese. This scene with Lazar, mm. this this is one that jumped out at me as, like, wh- what is Bond supposed to be? Like, this isn't Bond. Because Lazar, ultimately, like, he's a businessman, he's an honest businessman, he's a craftsman, he obviously takes pride in what he's doing. Okay, yeah, he doesn't ask questions about who he's selling things to, right? Mm. But, ultimately, he's a he's a great craftsman uh, who's feeding his family, right? And Bond's negotiation tactics with him is pointing a gun at his cock and saying, tell me everything I want or I'm going to shoot your cock off. <laughs> like, is that... Sean Connery wouldn't have done that. Like, well, even when Sean Connery was roughing someone up, he would never have just pointed a gun at them and said, like, tell me everything I want to know or I'm going to shoot you. Well, this is one of the problems with Bond in this film. He is, I would really say, much harder and harsher than he is in other films. And yeah. I'm not sure if it's just how Roger Moore's playing it or, g- g- you know, you give that same script to Sean Connery and it wouldn't have been as pronounced, but... There is yeah, just, Sean Connery yeah. would have done it in a playful way. I know that's like threatening to shoot someone in the balls. No, 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 exactly. In a playful way. But he would have done it. Like, yeah, there would have been, would have been just a bit more like, oh, you know what? I've got like, this gun's here. I'm suggesting that I might. Be yeah, it would have been like, you. do you want me to shoot your dick off with a little like grin and a, <laughs> a raised eyebrow? <laughs> but then there's more, there's more coming later as well. That Bond's just a bit of a twat in this film. Well, and, yeah, and but definitely he's always a bit of a twat. Really, he? but really, just outright aggressive and very creepy as well with women. Oh, in yeah. this one, yeah. and I know, yeah. obvi- like, yeah. obviously, that's something that Connery could do well, um, get away with that, mm. um, and apparently Roger Moore can't. Mm. Well, should we come to that bit next? Because shortly after the Lazar scene, Maud Adams, well, she's already been introduced, but her character Andrea Anders, who is um, Scaramanga's sort of a uh, mole. Sort of yeah. like a kept woman who's terrified of um, leaving him. And indeed, she's the one that sent the bullet to Bond in MI6 because she wants him to help her get out of this terrible situation. She's it's implied it's an abusive relationship. Um, she's mm. trapped in it. She wants to get out of it. And I think the way that Maud Adams plays it is, you know, she's not the best of actresses, but it's a fairly decent performance, a believable and realistic mm-hmm. one. And meanwhile, Bond is... Like literally slapping her, and 
yeah. threatening to break her arm to get information out of her, where she's yeah, sort of like literally beating information out of her. Yeah, it's very like is that just has that just aged badly, or was that weird when this film came out? No, because we've talked about Connery slapping women about and stuff, and we've said that's aged badly. But you can totally see it in context. This just seems aggressive and horrible. Yeah, yeah. even even within the context. Well, it's especially because this character is an abused woman who just wants yeah, freedom. Yeah. She's just desperate to get out of this horrible situation, and there's no yeah. sympathy from Bond. It's just, and I think we'll we'll come to we'll come to this scene in more detail later on. But the one where he has both the girls in his room, um, mm, there's a bit yeah. where Maud Adams is like like she's begging him to just like kill this man who's um uh you know got this hold over her and she just offers herself up like as sex she's just like you can have me if you want like i'm attractive like just do it like come on like she obviously doesn't want to either i don't get the sense that she really wants it and bond's response <laughs> to that is like all right then yeah fine um yeah and then makes the other one hide in the cupboard and listen well yeah exactly yeah and she's and she's clearly <laughs> quite distressed about that as well. Yeah. Like, it, she doesn't kind of go, oh, James, oh. Mm. And that's different to other Bond films, because in another Bond film, or with Connery, he would have got her out of the room and like, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, I was going to see you, but uh, something's come up, sorry, got her out, and then mm. got the other woman in. Not sit in the wardrobe and listen to me fuck this woman. It's like, there's a there's a difference there. And it, it's we we kind of know that Bond has sex with people sometimes... Just for the uh, Queen and Country, right? For just mm. as part of the, in the line of work, but there's always a sense of like, well, <laughs> I lie back and think of Britain, eh? Yeah, well, uh, what a tough <laughs> job. Uh, someone's got to do it. Whereas with this, it's like this is just a job, mm. and you have to accept that. Like hiding the wardrobe. Yeah, it's just it's just so much more creepy and yeah. Gross. Just some of the facial contortions mm. that Roger Moore comes out with as well, like when he's sort of yeah. trying to do sexy leering and he just can't do it. It's just <laughs> not. I, I guess they must must have been directed that way. Like, oh, come on, do like you mm. know, don't make it look smarmy. Make it like he can do like smarmy, charmy. You know, we'll see that in future films. But when he tries to do like dark, sexy Bond, it just oof, no. Yeah, not good at poor it. Roger though. Because I, I had a photographer once tried to take my picture for something, and, <laughs> and she kept giving me all these directions, like, just sort of put your arm up here, to, you know, open your grin, like, show show your teeth and smile, and it's like, this is so unnatural for me, this isn't going to look <laughs> right. And then I looked at the picture, and it's like, that's the weirdest fucking thing, like, that, that, that looks like I'm auditioning for Cirque du Soleil or something, it's not... <laughs> just to quickly finish cap off my... Uh mini thesis on Andrea Anders and how she's the most tragic figure to ever appear in a Bond film. Um, the fact that that character, like, after Bond sleeps, she, well, she offers herself up to Bond as sort of, like, payment for killing Scaramanga. She uh, goes back to Scaramanga and in the next scene we see her, she's dead. She's been shot. And she's just yeah. perfectly frozen watching a boxing match or something. Um, yeah. And then that's just handled with very little There's no emotion. fanfare at all. It's just, yeah. like, it's so matter of fact. Yeah. Like, to the point that I almost... I, I had to kind of uh, take inventory in who all the characters were. Because mm. for a second I was like, wait, was that the same woman from before? Mm. Or was that some new character? Because, yeah, because it was just so... All right, moving on. Mm. It just mm. felt very odd. It's a very mean-spirited thing to do to that character as well, who's just abused mm. and unhappy and... Uh, in terrible situations all the way through this and trying desperately to get out and then she dies and, that, and that's, you know, mm. that's it. There's no remorse. It's just, wow, yeah, I think she's very poorly treated um, and it's just a bit unpleasant. Mm. I quite like that scene in the sense of, like, the things getting passed around and uh, and the, the his little sidekick comes over and, like, takes it as oh, a peanut that. seller and all that. Mm. Just that, kind of the little so... heisty bit. Was all right, but it was just so like fucking convenient that that guy happened to come past at that moment. And... Well, yeah, we haven't really talked about Bond's. Um, yeah, I, I didn't like in Thailand yeah. and Hong Kong. And right, so I'm going to catch up with my notes quickly to yes, about where we are. Yes, so I made a note. Uh, what the fuck you. is this strip club about? Oh, the <laughs> where bottoms the women up serve club. drinks where they're like while they're stripping. <laughs> Have you never been to Thailand? No. <laughs> oh well, is that a thing? <laughs> Anything's a thing in Thailand. <laughs> 
Oh, all right. Fair enough. I was 12 years old when I was there and I saw some things. My God. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what happened. I thought it was going to be a ping pong match. <laughs> <laughs> We knew, we knew there was a moment that turned him. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, the, the sort of in betweeny ones. So, yeah. <laughs> um, right. So yeah, Bond's out in the street following uh, some stuff, and then someone gets shot. Yeah. Um, I was thinking, like, man, this does this must look so dodgy. He's just a guy with a gun there. They're not addressing it. But then the police turn up and they're like, oh, you're under arrest. Man with a gun next to a dead guy. He's just been shot. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, cool. But then I was like, what? what's the point in having a license to kill if he's not just like, oi, here's my fucking license. I'm allowed to. <laughs> well, he didn't kill him because because they go... No, I know, but... Because they go, what, what are you talking about, license to kill? What's this? <laughs> <laughs> and why can we speak English? <laughs> You know how you know how Bond <laughs> Bond has like a master's degree in Oriental language. Uh, yes. Yeah. He doesn't use it much, does he? No. Here he seems more perturbed I mean, by. Uh... And they go from they go from Hong Kong to Bangkok in like five minutes. So mm. you know he must have run the gamut of Asian countries. <laughs> should have used all his skills. Should we get Japanese Bond in here? I've not heard from him in a while. I Where's think we Thai should Bond? get Thai Bond. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh god, it's no, it's it's ping pong bottles. <laughs> um I think uh like obviously he's taken to the uh they do that thing that they love to do when he's like oh he's being taken somewhere by the villains. Oh no, wait, they're all on the same side. Um and MI6 yeah. have set up office on like the, a half submerged this. uh ship, which I thought was really cool. I loved that scene. I like that. I hated I... this scene. What? It was just so fucking contrived that that policeman happens to be working with the British government and they all know who Bond is and take him back to the... It was so fucking convenient. Well, of course everyone writing. knows who Bond is. He's the shittiest secret agent ever because he just keeps <laughs> telling people he's Bond James Bond. <laughs> It, but it I just... did like what I liked was that set with the listing ship. Yeah, um, that was and all right. I thought that was a really nice visual. I thought that's interesting. I did make a note. Uh, I wonder if they'll actually use this in a significant way. Mm. Uh, no, they didn't. No, no, no. <laughs> I just think it's a nice visual flourish. I think it's fine. It felt like a weird counterpart to Scaramanga's funfair lair. It felt very mm. similar to that. Mm. And it all it all had a vibe of like the Adam West Batman show, like, they were using some sets left over or something. Mm. It was the sort of mm. thing you'd expect 1960s Riddler or 1960s Penguin to live in. It was, mm. But, uh, you know, yeah, it was it was a cool, um, visually nice thing. Mm. But like you say, I just wish they kind of made something more of it other than... Yeah. yeah. Mm. I do love the scene after that, though, the karate school. Oh, uh, now... <laughs> I don't know how I feel about this. <laughs> I love it. I love that James Bond does a, a full on like Simpsons jumping out the window <laughs> head first. <laughs> like, look over there! And just, like jumps out the window <laughs> I uh, love that. to escape. It's ridiculous. I hate that um, as they're running away, the, the that guy from before turns up and he's brought his twins with him. And oh, he's like, his nieces. Super kung fu masters. Oh, I yeah, love that. Like, where one's like <laughs> stand back girls, and then they like go and kick ass, and yeah, I loved that. I thought that was really fun. I hated it. Oh, I loved it. What I didn't <laughs> like was that his um his mate like they're all running to the car, and then the girls get in, and Bond's running around yeah. to the other side, and his mate just drives off. Was, and... Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't. I was trying to figure out like, oh, there must be some plot reason. Like he's had to leave him there. He's going to come round because he's got to pick something up, yeah. and then he's going to come round and grab him. Like he's jumping on the roof. But no, he just he just panicked and set off too soon. Is that what well, it was? The only thing that I can contrive from it is that Bond slams the door, and in the mix, the sound of the door slamming is slightly higher than it should be. So I wonder if that's supposed to be a tip of like he thought that Bond was in the back. That doesn't explain why he doesn't listen to his nieces, who were quite obviously being like, "Well, hang on a minute, what are you doing?" Uh, Wait. I like that the nieces use that classic master of kung fu move, smashing a watermelon over someone's head. <laughs> <laughs> really authentic, like martial arts on display. Mm, but of well, course, I bet Jackie Chan's done it. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, him driving off leads to a boat chase along the uh, 
uh, yeah, and, Bangkok canals, so Kalongs, whatever they're called. We keep talking about how Bond is a, a sort of darker, less pleasant figure in this film. <laughs> Yeah. He owes that kid, like, loads of money. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because his boat gets jammed and then a, a a boy trying to sell a wooden statue of an elephant turns up and is wanting money. I, I, I like that little exchange, but I felt really bad for the kid. It's like, but th- that's the sort of coda you need at the end, where, like, Bond goes and pays the kid, like, a, a load of money. Or he goes back to his house and... Bonds have something <laughs> sent there by, you know, Yeah, 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 yeah. But the, the, the obvious thing to do there would be, oh, I'll give you 20,000 baht or whatever it was. And then he tells him, and then he gives him a note. You know, he gives him something. And the kid goes, oh, no, this isn't enough. And then he shoves him out. But it's like, you know, he's giving him something. Mm. Or, or at least have, like, a, cu- a couple of bullets whiz past so he chucks the kid off to, for his own safety. You know, something. Yeah. Just some little thing, rather than him just going, oh, stupid little foreign kid. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> it is funny when you listen to... Roger Moore does an audio commentary on the DVD, and it's like, UNICEF lead ambassador Roger Moore <laughs> is just not pushing poverty-stricken Thai children into a dirty canal. So, uh, yeah, he's he's sort of like... Maybe I shouldn't have done that. (laughs) Poor kid. Hello, listeners. This is the point in the show where I like to take the opportunity to push you towards our social media platforms. And this week, I'd like to remind you that we are working our way through the Bond franchise, and the previous eight installments are all available on our website, dimreturns.com where you'll also find our entire back catalogue of episodes. So if you're new, go and catch up at dimreturns.com. All right, that's enough. Now back to the show. Anyway, then we get the return of a mm. fan-favourite character from the previous film, yeah, now this, Sheriff this J.W. Pepper. Highlight of the entire film. <laughs> Like, you know, if you just had it, like, Bond is speeding past and he, like, gets water on the sheriff and his wife, who are inexplicably in Thailand on holiday. They're, um, they're travellers. They you... like to travel the world. He, he seems like a man who likes to experience different cultures uh, <laughs> and, and broaden his mind. <laughs> oh, it's like, I don't know what kind of travel agent they go to in Louisiana. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, this does not seem like a natural fit. But I was thinking, like, if you just had that one shot of, like, Bond going past Splashing Water on the Sheriff and he's like, God damn. And saying, that would be fantastic. Yeah, if you just had that one shot, that would have been a nice little thing. But they keep yeah. bringing him back again and again. Oh, it's a full again. subplot again. <laughs> that go, like, pointless tangent. That... Again. And again, like, I love it. But, oh, yeah, I, from I an objective point of view, it should have been a quick little cameo, like you say. Oh, yeah, just... yeah. I do have a question though. Is is pointy heads a racial slur? Um, I, I can, oh, and, it, and if so, is. why? Why? What? what, what if it, well, why, is, if, is, if is, they are known for hats. having pointy heads, I don't know what. Is it not those little hats that they wear in ah, the rice fields? They don't. None of the people around him are wearing them though. But maybe it's yeah, just which like is why a it's general, a racial slur. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I will say it's not racist enough that it has stopped ITV playing it during the daytime. <laughs> Uh, in its own editor. It's because it's such a because it's, it's it's one that's not carried around. I guess it's just yeah. not. And he says little brown water hogs as well, which I presume yeah. is supposed to be. It's, it's, it's a sort of <laughs> it's a sort of racial slur. I'd expect to hear Jeremy Clarkson getting into a scandal over. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Never heard anyone say that before in my life. <laughs> what? Every so time true. he gets done for something, it's like what? What's that word? Yeah. What do you what do you mean eeny meeny miny mo was racist? I had no idea. <laughs> Never heard oh, yeah. that version oh, before yeah. Clarkson. <laughs> it is, yeah. Um and, so uh yeah. now there is a point here, uh I've I've put an elephant pushing a fat man into a, into <laughs> water. Why do I get the impression that Calvin thinks this is hilarious? I love that Well no, I don't love that. <laughs> I think it's good. <laughs> The word, that must have happened in a Laurel and Hardy film. A baby elephant pushes Oliver Hardy into a river. <laughs> That, it, I bet that's happened, doesn't it? I don't know if they ever had a, an elephant. In a, of course they would. There well, must be there must be a Laurel and Hardy film where they're in a circus. Yeah, yeah there is. Yeah. Oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah I forgot the circus. Yeah. Mm. There, if you listen to the actor on the DVD extras, he talks about how that was like an accidental thing that the 
elephant pushed him in the canal. So he's a liar as well. <laughs> well sort of like, did, so he pushed you in and then did the director decide, oh, this is too good. Let's do it again from another three angles. Uh, I, yeah, I don't really know. But yeah, I like it when him and his wife get off three the... cameras at once. You know, that might be in the approach. I like it when him and his wife get off the thing and she sees all the elephants and she's like, oh, I gotta get me one of those elephants. And he says something like, they're Democrats, me, Bill. And... No, no, he says, no, he says, because the elephant is the symbol of the Republican Party. Um, And so he's saying elephants, but we're Democrats. Oh, he's saying we're Democrats. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I guess it's after that that we get the kerfuffling uh, him Bond chucking one Bond girl in a cupboard while he... I quite like Britt Eklund in this film, you know. I I never quite Hmm. bought her as being a, a... the sexy landlord's daughter in the Wicker Man. She's never Ew. really been my cup well, of tea. Like... She is a bit more kind of cute, like with her sticky out ears. I quite like that, yeah. but I'm not really. No, I, I do, and I, I, it's the first time I've watched a Bond film and thought, actually, I quite like this Bond girl Good from a, from the from the point of view that I'm supposed like because you're meant yeah. to look at them and go, oh, I like her. Four. Exactly. <laughs> it's the first time I've actually like had that. Yeah, no, well, I'm surprised, um, but pleased to hear you say that. She's famously one of the least favourite Bond girls amongst fans, but I think she fits in perfectly really? well she's with a, what they're doing She's here. a total twat of a character. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. She, she is the... One of my notes was she's the shittiest spy ever. Well, yeah, I mean, like, she's, she's... <laughs> she's a dumb blonde who, like, you know, she's in a bikini at the end and leans on a switch, which causes trouble. <laughs> yeah, <Bond>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the major plot point is that her big fat that. ass turns a laser on. Like what? <laughs> fucking... Yeah, but I, 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 I she's like, trying. That was like a carry on. For what's going on guy. here? Yeah, it's a carry on Bond, and I, <laughs> I think she fits in perfectly. She gets to keep her own voice, which uh, she didn't get to do in The Wicker Man. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, and which a lot of Bond girls didn't get to do either. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question though, because her name's Good Night, right? Merry oh, goodnight. Oh God! But is is it yeah. never used? It's never used for punning purposes. I was waiting for him to go. Oh, I only have one good night a year, or something like that. Well, uh, at the some end, shit line like that. Yeah. At the end, M says good night, good night, and Bond says good night, sir. And I think that's as close oh, yeah. as we get. But we we have um, uh, brushed over Chumi, who is one of the better. <laughs> <names> <laughs> Oh God, I forgot. Chew me, <laughs> Jesus Christ! What is, what is, why, why are there twenty four of these films? <laughs> <laughs> but it is literally one shot of her, just so she can say, so he can go, "What's your name?" and she can go, "Chew me." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the only purpose. Of it. Yeah. Oh God. Anyway, yeah. did you have any more notes about the scene with all Bond and the girls in the room with the closet and the? Because then we do have the scene in the uh, boxing ring where they're passing around the MacGuffin, the Solex agitator that all the spies and characters are after, which is quite good. And Scaramanga tells quite an interesting story over that scene, I think, about like how uh, he was brought up in a circus and there was this um, animal tamer who was mean to one of the animals that Scaramanga liked, so he killed him. I think it's quite a good, like, sort of creepy tale, but it's just like sort of skirted over with all these shots of Bond faffing around with the Solex and getting it passed around and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Are we meant to take that point blank as well? Because it, it really struck me like one of those tales the Joker would tell in The Dark Knight where you're mm. sort of like, is this bullshit? <laughs> <laughs> or I mean, I guess it fits in with the kind of fun fair, fun house yeah. lair he's built himself, but yeah, he's got a midget sidekick. Mm. Yeah, he's got three nipples. So he's probably <laughs> in the freak show himself. <laughs> mm. um, so we get to the car chase here. Do we know why the sheriff would be looking to buy an American car while he's in Bangkok? Because he's not going to drive one of those fucking foreign pieces of shit, <laughs> is he? He needs a car that's too big to go on the roads. Calvin, what do you think of the comedy whistle sound effect oh. that plays as they <laughs> jump the car oh, across the it. river? I hate it. It diminishes what is a fabulous stunt. Like, it's amazing. They did it for real, everything. It was so cool. And then you have this stupid... 
Like, <laughs> yeah, that, that's my thought was. Oh, that would have been cool if they hadn't just ruined it. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I, I I don't mind it. But that whole chase would be a really nice little sequence, and then it's just kind of capped off with this horrible. Yeah. I, I love all the stuff with the sheriff like sticking his head out of the car and screaming at <laughs> pe- uh, fellow motorists. <laughs> My my next notes is to do with going to the island at the end. Ah, oh, right, yes, yes, okay. Because Scaramanga flies in a flying car back to his island, <laughs> and Bond pursues. I, it's, it's very um, it's very Thunderbirds. All of this. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Was Thunderbirds doing a riff on this or? No, no, no. I just think it was. You know, that's what models were like back in that day. It's very Grand Theft Auto. You drive into a, a garage and yeah. then you come out. <laughs> 30 seconds later with wings <laughs> strapped on. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it's quite a cool island hideout. Um, oh, the fun house. But I do, I, all of it is mm. quite a nice lair. Mm. Um, but I do have to ask, has Scaramouche ever seen a mushroom? <laughs> Scaramouche? Scaramouche? <laughs> Can he do the Scaramanga. Yeah. Has he ever seen a mushroom before? All right, thank you. Yeah, because this is, I'm really curious, like, what they think a mushroom looks like. Because they talk about this mushroom-shaped rock that's, you know, there, and it's... That, that's not shaped like a mushroom to me. Is it to you? <laughs> no. All right. Mushrooms come in all, like a mushroom. all sorts of shapes and sizes, so you can pretty much get well, away with yeah, one. Because if you say to someone, mushroom-shaped, they know what you mean. Yeah. Regardless of, like, the, the... Yeah. Regardless yeah. of the, the um, technicalities behind it. It's like saying star-shaped... If someone said something star shaped, giant like, ball of fire. Really, it should mean spherical, but it doesn't mean spherical. It means like pointed, pointed spiky, either five or six, depending on your religion. Yeah, but um, you know, um, you know when you, if you ever go to anywhere like, especially anywhere like Yorkshire, Derbyshire, they always have a rock formation where it's like, oh yeah, this is called the Lady of the Cave because you can see the lady's <laughs> face and breasts and shit. It's like no, no, you can't. <laughs> I just think he seems like someone who, you know, if it meant that much to him, he could send like someone out there to carve it into the shape of a mushroom or something. <laughs> like, carve his face on it. And go, you see that rock that looks like me? <laughs> see that rock that looks like the shape of a third nipple? <laughs> you see the, that rock over there that looks like my golden gun? <laughs> Which, that that's a weird phallic thing that's going on throughout this film, isn't it? That is intentional. Yeah. Right? Yeah. When he's rubbing his golden gun all over her face. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cool. No, it's all right. Yeah, and, you know, him and, you know, he positions the duel with Bond as, you know, my golden gun against your Walther PPK. It's, you know, his little, little snub nose Walther. <laughs> PPK? Pork pie king. <laughs> <laughs> So what, how did you uh, feel about this final duel between Bond and uh, Scaramanga? I mean, the, the second we opened in this uh, lair, it's like, okay, so the the final moments <laughs> yeah, of this yeah. film are going to be Bond coming back to do the exact same thing. Mm. Um, but, you know, that all as obvious as that was, it was, you know, a nice little satisfying callback. Mm, um, mm. As far as Bond finales go i guess it was more interesting than uh oh the island's gonna blow up or something so yeah, which, which it does right. <laughs> no i know but it was it wasn't just running around like camera shaking mm. uh you know siren sounding mm, mm. um yeah it was all right it annoyed me that he like where did at the end there's that statue of him yes and then christopher lee walks in but the statue's actually bond and he tricked him yeah where's he put the statue well, yes. He just shoved it around the corner. I love how he got the clothes off the statue. Like, that would be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he had to cut his fingers off as well to make it convincing. Mm. Yeah. And I love that the, that the statue was holding a loaded <laughs> Walther PPK. Uh, that's lucky, isn't it? <laughs> because Bond loses yeah. his. But yeah, I did. I liked the idea that, you know, he had this giant laser made from the sun. That was mm. a gold golden ray, you know, it's the golden gun. I like that kind of little tie in. Would have been nice to sort of get that earlier so we can go, oh, it's a golden mm. gun, I get it. Yeah. Mm. But um yeah, or just u- use it somehow. Use the weapon a bit before it gets foiled. Hmm. 
It would have been nice to just have a shot of like the Sydney Opera House being like destroyed or something. I mean, I don't think it'd been built at this point. <laughs> what do we have back then? Statue of Liberty. Um, when was this film? When was the film made? Nineteen seventy-four. Ah, well, the Twin Towers went up in seventy-four. They would have been very topical at the time. Mm. Let's not take them down. Uh, Empire State Building's fair game, though. Okay. And then, yeah, we should have just had a shot inserted. This is how I'd improve the film if I could. The exact same film, but then at the end, there's, they turn it on and there's a shot of the Empire State Building being set on fire, and then the camera pans across, and there's just like a, a, a gorilla takes his hat off and throws it on the ground because he's furious because he's about to. <laughs> no, no, he's, he's drinking from a bottle. <laughs> he throws it away <laughs> and rubs his eyes and goes. Whoop. You know we do I mean, have a, no. There's a pigeon. There's a pigeon looking at it, <laughs> and the pigeon does a double take. You know, for the next few Bond films, we do have various characters drinking and looking at the bottle, and like oh, yeah. it happens oh, in like every. In fact, it happens several times in Moonraker. But it's uh, yeah, it's a bit of a trope of the next few Roger Moore Bond films. Is that is that what replaced J.W. Pepper? <laughs> yes. So you don't like these uh, kind of endings where it's kind of over and then they have a little coda on the end where the villain or the hench person comes back for revenge, but yeah. Nick Knack does it here. Um, yeah. What did you think of it? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I'm not a big fan of them structurally. It feels a bit weird, but yeah, it was, mm. you know, it's fine. Do you, if know, you have to do that. This, this, it's a bit uh, belittling, if I dare use that word, to uh, <laughs> little people. Because yeah. any other any other sidekick who came in at the end, he would kill them or blow them up with a cake mm. or throw them off a ship or whatever. But because it's just a little midget guy, he can just shove him in a suitcase and then carry him off. And they go, ha, ha, ha. Let me out, you yeah. big bully. <laughs> it's taking a piss, isn't it? Yeah, it is a bit, yeah. And he's still alive at the end. One of the few Bond henchmen to... Bond villains to still be Do alive. He, does he come back? Does he ever come back? No. Shame. Well, that's my idea for the sequel. <laughs> what, Nick Knack and Sheriff Pepper? Uh, no, I, I think... I'm, I'm surprised Nick Knack never comes back. That's Nick that Knack and Ricardo Montalban on an island. It just seemed, <laughs> Yeah, it seems like he'd be a Jaws figure where he'd pop up down the line with uh. another new boss. I, I would bring him back, like, as a big twist reveal in one of the Daniel Craig films where it's, you know, it's sort of like this person's messing with Bond... <laughs> The, the actor like, died about 20 years ago. So that, that might be Yeah, fun. well, you're not going to cast the same guy in a Daniel Craig Bond, are you? Peter Dinklage. Cast... There you go. <laughs> Who is playing Hervé Villachet in a HBO yeah. biopic, I believe. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> so, the, 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 that, that very end, you know, when they do the little sh- shagging scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's always, like, little, little gag euphemisms or whatever. Um, and in this one, you know, when M asks for her on the phone, he goes... She's just coming, sir. Mm. Now that's that's not exactly a euphemism, is it? It's not very no. subtle one. As yeah, they go, yeah. <laughs> no, it isn't. But he could have said, he could have said, uh, Bond, Bond, have you? Uh, how's it gone? Have you had a good night? Well, I'm about to, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it's something to be said that the uh, production were sort of running on empty at this point. Like, the screenwriter, Tom Mankiewicz, said that he was, like, on it, and then off it, and then they asked him back to do a rewrite on another writer's rewrite of his original script, and then he left again, they brought someone else, and it was just... The script was constantly being rewritten. The director, it was his third one in four years. Um, there were a load of production troubles behind the scenes, so you'll notice that <clears throat> the producers' names on all the films so far have been Albert R. Broccoli and Harry Saltzman, and Harry Saltzman... <coughs> Um, sold his part of the partnership, so for the next film, it's just Cubby Broccoli. Um, <laughs> and yes, that is the family that brought Broccoli to America. Uh, chubby Broccoli. <laughs> Cubby! <laughs> um, I was, did have one other note. Um, you know the people playing M and Money Penny? Are they the same from right from the beginning? Yeah, yeah. Because I basically made a note here that Money Penny is getting a bit too old. <laughs> she's, she's she's just getting a bit too old to be the sexy secretary. Oh, leave her alone. Wait, is Money Penny meant to be sexy? Well, in a kind of dowdy secretary, I never get the man kind of way. Mm. But when do they replace her eventually? 
Uh, not for another uh, five films. <laughs> so yeah, she. Um, well, I mean, we'll see in her last few appearances. They're not terribly flattering what they do with her. But uh, uh, well, you know, at least middle-aged women getting work in the film industry. <laughs> that's something. They do bring in a replacement in one of the films called Miss Penelope Smallbone. But <laughs> it's, uh... <laughs> oh, oh no, Christ. it's Smallbush. Sorry, no, it's Smallbush. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so yeah, it's not Smallbone. It's Smallbush. Sorry, you were a little bit Jesus. of a little bit of Freudian Fucking slip there, Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Man with the Golden Gun wasn't terribly terribly successful when it was released, so there was a three-year hiatus, and then uh, we got The Spider Left Me a few years later, which sort of relaunched the series somewhat. Glang! So... Glang, 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 (laughs) So... Glang, glang! So if you had to rate The Man with the Golden Gun, how would you rate it? It's an eight from me. (laughs) I give it a six. I give it a three. A three? Yeah. Oh, that's so unfair. <laughs> I think my six is very generous, though. Yeah, I, I think, think that's it, fair. I don't think it deserved maybe a bit lower. No, no, it didn't. No, six is fine. I think this one's messier and got more problems with it than a lot of them, but it also had a lot of individual like elements and sequences that I enjoyed more than... I found myself less bored, for the most part, than I do mm. during most of these. So, yeah, six. So... What's our pitch? Is it going to be a knickknack or a Sheriff Pepper? Uh, <laughs> what I would like to see, actually, is I think if you were to take this subject matter, a lot of this stuff from The Man with the Golden Gun, and made a more serious, like, Craig era film with it, I think that could be kind of interesting. If you did it, sort of, some of the more serious um, elements of the plot, you could do it justice. Like, we talked about Andrea Anders, you could handle that much more sensitively. Hang on, what what subject matter are we talking well, I'm, you know, stuff about the abused woman and uh, okay. need, needing bonds to help her out, and yeah, you, you know, um, there's cool. that, and also just Scaramanga is sort of like a dark side of Bond, and as we talked about, all the sort of euphemism uh, of the guns and measuring up their guns against each other and all that kind of. Thing. What about the man with the golden buns? It's about a gay porn star who's mm. smuggling something in his rectum. You're not doing serious pictures here, Alan. Not like my remake and Souls uh, Revenge of Knickknack pictures. <laughs> oh, Remember knickknacks? They were good, though. The Do you know what? The oh, weird thing is, dreadful I, dreadful I, ate, I had some knickknacks yesterday for the first time in oh. ages after I watched this film a few days earlier. Coincidence? <laughs> yes, it was. It was, actually. I didn't mind them. Was it, or did you kind of subconsciously go... When you were watching it, knickknacks. Oh, I've not had knickknacks in a while. And then you're in the shop and you're like, oh, I'm bagging knickknacks. No, because someone else bought them for me without any prompting right, yeah, whatsoever. <laughs> Just a coincidence. Terrible crisps. Which Terrible flavor, crisps. though? No, they're no, nice. The sticky the, rib the ones sticky, were nice. The spicy ones. Nice and Yeah, it's the rib. The crunchiness is not right. I really enjoy The them. rib ones are good. The other ones aren't. That's what I remember. Mm. I like those rib ones. Uh, so. Okay. James <laughs> Bond. <laughs> Can we have a ca- uh, can we have a, a Bond villain called Monster Munch? <laughs> Monster Munch or Monster Mash? Monster Munch. What did you say? Monster Munch. I think that's a Bond girl. And, and that brings us back to Vincent Price. <laughs> right. Monster okay, here's this. Vincent Price as a Bond villain, right? Let's build it around him. All right. And he's But Monster Munch is definitely the Bond girl of this film. All his henchmen oh. are like Frankensteins and Draculas. Yeah. Horror Bond. <laughs> Huh? All right, brilliant. I like this. So he, he lives in a big spooky castle. Yeah. Christopher Lee can come back as Dracula. He, li- he lives <laughs> with his mother, <laughs> who may or may not be dead. <laughs> yeah, we never see the mother. She's just upstairs, like, and he has to, you know, keep going to take her food and stuff. Oh, and but his main henchman is this young boy who's got scissors for hands. <laughs> 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 and so he keeps trying to slice everyone up. That's a pretty mm. cool Bond villain thing. Henchman thing. That is, a, yeah. yeah. Mm. That, yeah, that is very, yeah. And what what's the plot? He keeps trying to make an omelette with some <laughs> eggs. <laughs> you know what? Actually, James Bond in the books does love his bloody eggs. He, he's always going on about eggs. And he makes a quiche in a view to a kill. <laughs> God, he would like quiche, the worst food in the world. <laughs> I can't wait until we get to that film, just because Christopher Walken and 
Roger Moore making quiche. It's just, it's just a strange one, anyway. Does he does he like raw eggs as a hangover cure? Is that the thing? No, I don't know. I've no, he seems like a there. Bloody Mary type to me. Mm-hmm. So, so, come on, are we coming together with a plot here or what? I thought we already did one. So, wait, what are we doing? Horror Bond. Or, I was just going to remake it, but Alan's insisting that we do something <laughs> with Vincent Price. Yeah, I think and... it should be something new. If you're going to do a remake, though, who would you have? Who would be uh, Nick Knack? Oh, well, uh, Peter Dinklage. Okay, well, that's mm. route one. Um, so, <laughs> who, who would Tony you have Cox. as... Um... Warwick Davis. Scaramanga. <laughs> that's all of them. Possibly Benedict Cumberbatch. Ooh, yes. Scaramanga. Yeah. Uh, you can't afford Benedict Cumberbatch. Cumberbatch <laughs> is too... He's, he's already Khan. He can't come back and be uh, another iconic God. villain. Right. Who who would you get? Christopher Lee? Need someone freakishly tall. I already who? said Benedict Cumberbatch, but for some reason we can't afford him. Manu- for Ellen's Manu- bizarre Ball. rules. <laughs> what we can and can't pitch now, all of a sudden. <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not convinced by Cumberbatch. Oh, Stephen Merchant. <laughs> With Ricky Gervais' knickknack. Carl Pilkington's a knickknack, Carl Pilkington's a knick-knack <laughs> if anyone is. <laughs> Operate, <laughs> operate in the fun fair. Just like, I'm sick of this. Yeah, Cal Pilkington's the engineer guy, the one engineer who works there. <laughs> <laughs> what about um, Matthew Perry? Because he's got a third nipple. Has he? Chandler. Oh, Chandler. So he's doing it as he's Chandler. doing third nipple acting. It's the yeah. character of Chandler going, could I be any more evil? <laughs> and he's got a, a knickknack is played by a chimpanzee <laughs> <laughs> Marcel <laughs> spider monkey or an orangutan or something like that what about Jim Carrey he needs he needs a comeback role he's older now Ooh. he's Jim Carrey's really tall is he he's like six foot three or something isn't he right tallest actors <laughs> Sigourney Weaver. <laughs> John Larroquette is the top result <laughs> for tallest actors. There we go. That's our Scaramanga. <laughs> John Larroquette, Matthew Modine, Vincent D'Onofro, James Cromwell. Ooh! Oh no, he's too old now, isn't he? <laughs> James Ooh. Cromwell, like... T- well, James Cromwell, like, ten years ago. He would have been a good... It's still too like, no. He's too quiet yeah. and kind 20, of serene. Thirty years ago, he's looked eighty since he was about thirty-five. That'll do, knickknack. <laughs> 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 oh Jesus <geez laughs> Christ! <laughs> right, let's end it. We're just listing actors now. Uh, okay. Thank you for listening, and in fact, it's a very special thank you today, because this is an important milestone in the history of Diminishing Returns. You see, our good friend and founder member Calvin Dyson has decided that he can no longer continue his work here on the podcast. I'll just let you take a moment to let that sink in. Unfortunately, Calvin actually has a real career, and a social life, and is no longer able to commit to the considerable time demands that the podcast creates. But the good news is that Sol and I are far more irresponsible with our lives and we will always favour this Tim Pot podcast that doesn't pay us anything over a real job. So, Diminishing Returns will continue, but with a rotating roster of people to fill Calvin's empty chair, including, of course, Calvin himself, who will return to continue our Bond series, as well as dropping in for an episode here and there whenever his busy schedule allows. And what better way to sign off than with a previously unheard clip from one of our previous Bond episodes in which we discuss the fact that Calvin owns a golden gun, and you get a pretty good feel for our relationship together. Thank you, and see you next week. Is it actual gold that's no. plated the gun? No. <laughs> it's gold-plated. We're not going to get a solid gold. Well, I don't mean solid, but so, so it's real gold <laughs> coating it, then. Yeah.
yeah, yeah. The, well worth the worth every penny. So, I, how much do you think the materials <laughs> that were spent on it are worth? I I don't even want to think about it. Come it how, of, it. how often do you get it out and like play with it? Uh, <laughs> has it has it appreciated in value since you bought it, or or has it depreciated in value? <laughs> I, I I haven't had it valued. Uh, <laughs> can you maybe... get one Is it on eBay? <laughs> Should we? Oh let's, yeah, let's actually. see if we can so, find one on eBay. Have a look. Have a look. <clears throat> there, factory Entertainment Golden Gun. Right, let's see. Oh. <laughs> oh, there aren't any. <laughs> oh. oh, see, well, they're, they're so price. good that no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so no one wants to. Um... <laughs> No one wants to part with uh, such a unique <laughs> piece. <clears throat> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, you, you, you amuse me sometimes. <laughs> oh. Uh, there's one on eBay that sold for one thousand two hundred US dollars. Apparently. Oh my god. Maybe I'll, uh... Hmm. No, I couldn't. It's got too much sentimental value. <laughs> what sentimental value? You sat on your shelf. Remember the time I came into your room and made fun of it? <laughs> 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 oh. Good times, good times. Yeah, I, I don't think I kept it at the, uh, our student house because I was afraid that you'd do something to it. I think I had it over. <laughs> I had it over for a video that I did once, and then that was it. I was like, "Oh no, this is it. I, I, I must stay at home." <laughs> I mean, that was the right decision. Yeah. Yes, I. Otherwise, I, think. <laughs> I still we, like we, we the other day. The other day, do you remember? Do you remember when you and Matt Pryor like changed a load of the DVDs and Blu-rays? And I was the about cases? to say that. That's all I think I ever did in your room <laughs> was just chain put I... all of the DVDs in the wrong box <laughs> and then put them I back sold... on the shit. <laughs> I sold um, a few recently. I was like selling one like Music Magpie, that sort of thing. And I opened up my Full Metal Jacket Blu-ray, which um, I obviously haven't looked at in years. And it, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, was in there. And, uh, so I had to go and find where oh, the you have to Blu-ray follow the was. chain. Then <laughs> <laughs> everything else is fine. It was just that and Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. I obviously haven't watched in nearly a ten years. Swap. <laughs> <laughs> 